I've never done a microphone and a clicker at the same time. So uh, let's see how we do. Um, first of all, thank you so much for coming. This presentation, the focus is on... Sorry, is the streaming people asking to hold for just two minutes. No problem. Sorry. The anticipation builds. <laughs> Open that note. <laughs> Open the chips. Open the chips. Yeah, the to even though our that, 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 that line is so long. We saw. just want to emphasize that uh, we, when we say advocacy in, um, is a work in progress, and we started this process thinking that advocacy, like we would start advocating and then we'd get results immediately, like, and um, that's not how it works. Um, we realize that it's uh, the changes that are made within our school district, and we are three teachers within one school district, um, three teacher librarians. Um, it's, it's very slow, incremental change. So we're gonna talk about that particular process for us. Um, so um, the three of us work with six other librarians in our school district, so there are nine comprehensive high schools, and then a couple alternative schools that do not have librarian. Um, and uh, so, so just know that just the three of us are just a part of a much bigger crew of, of librarians who work together. Um, and this picture represents um, how we feel sometimes in the advocacy process, right? Um, right? We ask for things and sometimes we're told no. Um, and we ask for things and sometimes we're told like half yeses, partial yeses, um, major compromises. It's a frustrating process, but um, we have reframed our thinking to really start celebrating our successes which don't always line up with our goals, um, but really celebrating those successes. So we're gonna to talk to you about the cascade of change. Um, so the first question, and everything in this presentation is framed as a question, a question that you need to ask yourself. Uh, not questions that you ask others, but what, can you, what do you ask of yourself? So the first question is, the first two, um, what are your goals and what is success? So that was something we had to start thinking about. Um, our typical typical advocacy goals, and these were all our goals when we started in our district, uh, listed here, I'm sure you all have seen them before, right? More money, more staffing. Um, so we've had a really radical kind of change that happened within our school district. So we are Grossmont Union High School District. Next to us is San Diego Unified School District, which is the second largest school district in California. Um, our district has nine schools, like I said. Um, and in 2012, um, all of our librarians were pink slipped, and, the, um, and they were gonna be staffed by a paraprofessionals, a single paraprofessional, and then also the district library supervisor was also pink slipped. Those jobs were rescinded, like the pink slips were rescinded, but only because all of the teachers in the school district protested. We moved from that to uh, where we are today, where we have, um, where we've, we've had a lot of success. So I just wanted to give you that kind of perspective. Originally, the first goal that we set was just retain the teacher librarians. How can we make it so that we have jobs? Uh, San Diego Unified does not have librarians at all. Um, our second goal was really to take a look at um, our role and then the relevancy of libraries in general in our schools. And it was at this time, around 2014, 2015, where there were a lot of questions about what's the place of libraries now that there's been this kind of digital integration and tons of technology integrated into schools. Like, why do we even need libraries? And that was a conversation that was happening all over the place. Um, including um, with, I can't remember her first name, Waters? Audrey Waters. Um, and she made a list of the uh, hundred, like, um, 
biggest fails? Worst ed tech debacles of the decade. And number 82 was this concept of the end of the library. Um, because there were a lot of questions at the time. It's like, how relevant are libraries today? In fact, that happened directly with me. My very first year as a librarian, I walked into the San Diego Q Conference. A majorly important person in our district, an admin, um, walked into the library with me and he noted that there weren't a lot of books in that particular library, um, which is in North County, San Diego. And they did away with their librarians as well. And I had to give my elevator, elevator pitch right in that moment. And it was, it was a defining moment because he really didn't see the point of funding libraries anymore. So, um, but what we discovered is that libraries really ha are relevant and have a tremendous importance today. Today, our goal is really looking at resource equity. Um, we have different staffing and different funding for each of the libraries in our district. So that's something that we're working on today. So the, the goals have changed over time. Um, one of the first things that we started working on um, was how can we get involved at a district level and start promoting what it is that we know and do. So um, right away, uh, Suzanne and I gave a presentation on um, empowering students with research skills to like a very select group of teachers who were tech savvy um, and had, had a lot of specialized training. Um, from there, we gave a presentation that was available to all teachers in our school district, all 1,000 of them, so we got involved with doing uh, professional development on a district level. Um, and from then, I got invited to participate in the OER development um, at our school, for our school district. I even went to the Go Open Summit in Washington, D.C. Um, and uh, we even requested that we participate in our teacher induction program so that we could have an hour to talk to all the new teachers in our district about what library services look like and how we can support those teachers. I may not be able to change the minds of every teacher who's already working, but I can sure capture the, stud the new student teachers and the younger teachers who really don't know necessarily what libraries can do, particularly if at their high school, they didn't have a librarian. Um, so take a look at all of the different ways that we're involved in our district and our school site. Um, we strategically made a decision when um, Anthony, Suzanne, and I all came on board, and that was around, I started in 2013, they started in 2014, right? 2016? Oh, maybe I started in 2015. Oh, no, I started a while ago. Anyway, I think this is year six or seven, um, that we were gonna get our hands into every single organ, like committee that we could be a part of, because if we were gonna promote the library, we were just gonna get out there and start promoting it from within. Um, and that we could possibly steer these groups into doing things that would benefit the library, but we could always point out what we could offer in those groups. Hmm? <laughs> oh, this is all nine of us too. It's not just the three of us. We, we divide it and conquer among nine people. Um, so one of the ways also that we got really involved in our school district was uh, there was a conversation about updating our um, technology requirement that we had for all graduating students in our district. Um, and we uh, proposed that we help develop those standards that student and tasks that students would need to complete for graduation requirements. Um, and so you can see in the picture on the left that we like sat down after school one day and met together and did a sticky note process of developing those standards. Um, and now that we, the entire technology uh, requirement that is, that students, well the information literacy standards and those requirements were crafted specifically by librarians. And you can um, get more information by clicking on this particular slide. In addition, in our library council meetings, which we hold once a month with all nine of the librarians, we started talking about independent reading and the role of reading. That's like what we love the most as librarians. Not all the district mumbo jumbo that we have to do. We really love just promoting reading. So we started talking about how can we get more teachers really to re like provide greater like wider reading experiences for their students. Anthony was actually approached by a teacher at his school wanting more like opportunities for literature circles. Um, and so because he had the support of that teacher, he went to his principal, she 
she actually approved an $8,000 um, budget on purchasing these additional Lit Circles books that would be just used for English classes. When Anthony did that, he shared it with the rest of us. Then Suzanne was able to go to her principal and her English teachers. She made a similar purchase. Then I did it as well at my school. And so we were able to very slowly and incrementally spread more independent and wide reading in English classes um, as opposed to in, um, just reading that assigned text over and over again. We've had tremendous success. Students are much more engaged and that's spreading to the other schools, not just the three of our schools. Now we're supporting uh, the rest of the librarians as well. From there we developed uh, our whole district is uh, working on um, the universal de design for learning and creating units of study and lessons based on those principles. So Suzanne, Anthony, and I worked on a presentation to share out at San Diego Q. Um, and we're also giving this particular presentation at the Q conference. ISTE. Oh, ISTE, I'm sorry, at ISTE this year uh, in June. We're doing a different one on lateral reading at Q, right? Okay. <laughs> There are too many. Um, so that particular presentation was all about like how to apply the principles to just like reading tasks. Um, and when we gave that presentation at San Diego Q, there was a teacher in the audience who said specifically that she, you know, she would love to do this, but she doesn't have the resources, no funding, and no librarian to manage that. And it just so happened at that very moment, our superintendent walked by, because he does t attend the San Diego Q. And it was a key moment to be able to tell him and to celebrate, even though the support that we get is very small, it is notable and it makes a huge difference, especially in contrast to what other schools are doing in San Diego Unified and other nearby districts. So we always make sure that we tell those people, the administrators, the principals, our fellow teachers, what those successes are and our gratitude for those, because it has made a difference. It's like a cascade of, of, oh, remember that time that we helped you? Oh yeah, we can do that again. Honestly, that's why we're here today, is they approved to pay for it. <laughs> Another thing that happened is that one, a student from San Diego Unified, I happened to live in the San Diego Unified School District and my children went to Patrick Henry High School in that school district. Um, and a student from that school wanted to come over to my school and see what a functioning library really looked like. Um, so she spent a day with me just observing. She was doing a journalism assignment for her school newspaper that actually never got published as far as I know. And um, then she took that article that she wrote and she submitted it to our community newspaper. When that got submitted to the community newspaper, this is like the free paper that gets delivered to all the houses in our community. All these parents read it, right? And then those parents talked to the powers that be at Patrick Henry. There was a lot of pressure put on the principal uh, because their library was closed, no budget, old furniture, old books. Um, and as a result, I did not hear this from the student who wrote the article, who is a kid who lives in my neighborhood, but instead I heard it from another principal at another school, Scripps Ranch. She told me, she's like, hey, did you hear? Patrick Henry is opened up in the library. They're getting a budget and they're getting new furniture. And I was like, wow. And one of the things that I, I hold this as a huge success. It's not just about my school district or my schools. It's about all kids in the community and giving all kids access to books and to resources. They, they're not getting a librarian yet. I say yet. I think it's coming. And once Patrick Henry gets their situation going, I guarantee it's going to spill into the other nearby schools because they're going to say, Patrick Henry has it, why don't we? And I think that's important. So what does advocacy look like? Thank you. So we're thinking about advocacy and what kind of questions we answer with our advocacy. And really, it's about communication. And um, so we make uh, at a point, uh, we've planned uh, every few years we get in front of our principal's council in our district. That's a group that's made up of school principals. It's made up of um, our superintendent. It's, it's made up of high level district administrators. Um, the person who pays all the bills in the district is in the room. And we really want to communicate two big ideas, that the libraries, um, we are serving our students in the capacity that the district is hoping that we serve all our students, 
we're helping them achieve their goals. How is the library doing that? We want to be totally clear with that. And we also want to be clear uh, about what we're asking for. So we came there both to celebrate our successes and to say, this is the support we need. So we had that meeting. It was a great meeting. We got a lot of positive feedback. We didn't get every single thing we asked for. We didn't get the main thing we asked for. But we feel like being on the radar is a huge part of this step. And it's not like we did this once, and we're, gonna, we're never going to meet with that group again. We're going to meet with that group again. We're going to keep asking for the things that we're asking for and keep showing them um, what we're doing to help sell our district to the community. Um, the entire presentation that we have, um, it was much too long to, to add on here, but one thing we did want to highlight is we wanted to promote the idea that libraries are about equity and access, and we're not, we're not there, like uh, Stephanie was saying, we're not there just to promote our libraries or um, to ask for things for our library. We want to make it clear that this is with the goal of serving students, providing access to library services and materials across all of our campuses. Um, we also wanted to as much as possible, make clear connections between these are your district goals, here's what we're doing to, to help you achieve those goals. And then once a year, another way we communicate things that we're doing to help the, the, the school community. Um, Suzanne, I, I kind of stole this idea from Suzanne, she makes a Google site where she highlights uh, the, ten, the top 10 things that happened that year in the library and she shares it with staff and other stakeholders. So I thought, oh, I'm going to try that too. So I did the same thing. And it's just a very powerful thing for the people that don't necessarily come in the door that frequently, even on your school site, to share, this is what we're doing, check this out, isn't this cool, collaborate with me sometime this year, it'll be amazing. And so that's once a year, a big thing you can do once a year. But even in the moment, you can definitely use tools like social media, your Twitter accounts, your Instagram accounts, to share the little things that you're doing. You're creating like a, a, a documented record of the cool things that are happening uh, on your site. And I got to, um, you kind of have to be in the moment too. You got to be ready with your phone. You got to be ready with your account to, to post things, to record things. I got to run into the superintendent in a parking lot one time and I said, hey, we're doing a summer reading program. Can I get you for a minute saying, join the summer reading program? Sure, I'd be glad to help. It's, it's really about finding those opportunities and jumping for it. Even, you're, not, you're not bragging about your, yourself necessarily. You're, you're promoting the services that we're providing to students and creating as much access as possible. And we wanted to make the point through that, the whole presentation, it's not like um, advocacy is this, this sprint or this clear beginning, clear ending type phenomenon. This is something that you're going to come back to again and, and again and again. It's, it's going to be something where you, you make a little bit of progress on these different goals. If you're getting frustrated with one of the goals, you can work on one of the other goals that you have. Make, make progress, keep coming back to it, repeat it. Um, and definitely, I gotta stress that, come back to it. Uh, if you didn't get something, we didn't get everything we asked for when we met with Principals Council. We're gonna talk to them again, um, either this year or next year, but we're gonna keep coming back to it and keep asking um, and building our rationale of why we're asking for these things. Okay, so just like Stephanie mentioned, it's really a process of self-reflection and thinking about what are the questions that you need to be asking yourself. Um, and so this I borrowed from my husband, don't should on other people. <laughs> um, instead of saying they should be doing this for me or why don't they support us in this way, I really want to stop and think, what is it that I can do? Look at yourself in the mirror and see what is it that I'm not showing, what is it that I could do more of? Um, Really, it allows you to become more empowered because when you're so focused on what other people are doing or not doing for you, they have all the power that you can't control. But this really allows you to see uh, what you can do yourself. So one of the first questions we asked ourselves, um, I had a really difficult conversation with my principal and asked her for advice about what we could be doing differently in our library. And one of the things she pointed out is, who is your district admin who attends your monthly library council meetings? And we mentioned, well, uh, it's supposed to be Anthony's principal, but she never comes to our meetings. Um, the way that our meetings were structured at that time was that we went to each library each month so that we could see everybody's different library. What we didn't realize is that we had created a barrier for participation for his principal. So rather than assuming that she did not want to attend, Anthony had talked to her and found out she couldn't attend because principals are very busy and she couldn't make it to all of our sites. 
And so we made a shift from that moment and we started meeting every month at Anthony's Library, which is on her campus, and she started attending regularly. She has been at every meeting, um, pretty much as far as I could tell, um, even if she couldn't be there in person, she's called in since then, which is amazing, her commitment. And not only that, but Anthony nominated her and she was accepted as an ASL school leader collaborative member this past year. Um, she attended ASL with Anthony and I was able to attend as well. And the amazing thing is that it was a great opportunity for her to not only learn about what it is the work that we are doing right now or should be doing and i say should actually in this case it raised her bar of expectations for us and that's actually a really positive thing as an advocate for us that she now knows that we are capable of doing even more our libraries are capable of doing it even more and she's really pushing us as well not only to celebrate what we're doing and support us but um, encouraging us to take on more leadership in our district Yes, she w she attended vendor. Um, definitely. Um, and so for myself personally, um, when I was in library school, I created a very detailed library plan. We came back in our district. We attempted to create these multi-page library plans. We couldn't even necessarily get all of our own librarians to necessarily read the whole plan. There was no way that anybody else was ever going to read all of those. Um, and I heard a really great podcast that's linked here um, with Rebecca Smith Aldrich, and it said, um, really distill down your plan to answering what is your why. So that night I thought about it, and the next day I created a video um, for my library that I thought on it and thought on it. I'm like, it's really about connection for me in my library. We connect here. It's students connecting with one another. It's students connecting with resources, students connecting with me, teachers, everything like that. So there's a video link there with that, and I have that as the tagline on my various library communications. But then we move forward to um, the district-wide level. What is the why for our district libraries? And in this case, like we mentioned before, one-to-one -one computing has made a huge um, impact on the work that we do in the libraries. Most of us are in charge of managing the devices, and many of you are in those same situations where it's taken over a lot of our responsibilities. Um, and so the tagline for our one-to-one -one program in the district was future forward preparing students for their tomorrow. Oftentimes in the library, we feel buried in the Chromebooks. Those are all the boxes um, for Chromebooks. Um, but we also see it as an opportunity. And so we have also embraced our responsibilities with the one-to-one -one computing, but we wanted to shift the focus. We are future forward libraries. Not only is this program intended to prepare students for their tomorrow, but we in the libraries are opening doors for students today. We were talking literally about keeping library doors open in some ways, because in my library, for instance, I don't have a paraprofessional staff member, so our libraries do not have the same open hours as some of the other sites who do. Um, but we're also talking about opening doors of opportunity and how we do do that in our libraries. So in terms of what people may know about your library, they may just know your door, the front door of your library that they walk by when they are going to and from their classes. That could be students who don't come in, teachers who don't come in, admin who don't come in. So what can you do to show your work to the people who maybe have not stepped inside? What can you make visible and explicit? Um, so this is an example of my front door. I see students who are waiting for the doors to be open, sometimes bored and looking at the signs. I also see teachers who maybe haven't walked inside the library who glance at it when they're walking to the restroom, which is right near the library. Um, and so it is an opportunity that I use that's very simple. Everything here is hyperlinked if you want to see them closer up. Um, we have the regular library hours, but I also highlight the staffing that we have and how that translates to the hours that were open so they understand it's not a matter of me not wanting to be open, it's because of our staffing that these are the hours that are available for students. Um, I also have on the windows these other posters. So this was actually started by our AVID team. They wanted all the teachers to create profiles that they put on their doors and it was a great opportunity because you highlighted your college experience 
and what your educational goals are. So we have various staff members, the technology person who shares a building with me, he has all of his background um, in getting, I believe, his associate's degree and his A plus certification. Students are always surprised when they see this, that yes, not only do I have teaching experience, so I am one of the teaching staff, but also I have two master's degrees. So um, they will ask questions about that. <laughs> and you worked at Taco Bell. Yes, I added this, the, it wasn't part of the template, but I also wanted students to see my previous work experience, so I added that. I've worked everything from fast food, and I say that's why I am able to deal with the messes that happen in the library, because I understand that's part of when you have people coming into your space. Um, other examples, I have posters that are up about what the teacher librarian does. So I have examples, and then I have the screen, because I'm on my computer a lot during the day, because I'm working on a lot of digital projects. So I don't want them to think, oh, Ms. Sanwald is on her computer, she's doing shopping online or playing games. I would be fine if they live stream my computer, honestly, because it is always working on digital projects. Um, and then this is showing the tradition of staffing at our site. Not only were there two previous teacher librarians, but there were also at one time paraprofessionals who were also working in our library. Um, and then this is another version of the sign and just reminding students explicitly, you are my priority, this is why I'm here. You can interrupt me at any point when I am at the desk. Um, right now, when I am not in the library, since again, there are no other staff members, when I have a substitute, they are all by themselves and maybe have no experience. And you maybe have been put in, in a similar position where people are told like, oh, well, let's just send this person to work in the library. And it's really hard to find stuff to maybe keep that person busy the whole time. In reality, my substitute is supervising students, which is a part of my responsibilities, but it's one small part of my responsibilities. So in this binder, there are many instructions, and it's like 20 something pages long. <laughs> um, but I do have a chart that I created at one point that has the different people who may help out in the library and what each of those people can do. I haven't updated this recently, but I'll have these are all the things that I do as a teacher librarian, which every row pretty much is, is checked for the most part. If I had a library tech, these are the types of things that they would be able to do in the library. I have student aides who do make my job like survivable. I couldn't survive without them, but they can only help in these certain ways. If you are a substitute for me and you get bored during the day because you're basically supervising, that's because there are only certain functions that you can do without the proper training. Um, and so I always make that available. Um, this is a, an example of a Twitter thread. I did this experiment one day, it was really fun. I could only do this for one day, so if you do this, um, even if you do it for part of a day, I try to live tweet with pictures and stats, everything that happened in the library. I say it's the law of the library that people always walk in the moment it's empty. <laughs> And then they will make a comment about, wow, it must be so fun to have a job where it's so quiet. I'm like, you just missed two minutes ago, there were 200 kids in here. <laughs> um, and so this was my way to show in real time, there is an ebb and flow. I'll be having, you know, the, at the, by, between 7 a.m. and the end of period one, I had 194 visits from my door counter. Anthony's gonna be showing his sign-in sheet I can't, I can't have somebody staffed to do the sign-in sheet, so I at least have the door counter. Um, but if you click on there, you can see the full thread, and it's helping everything instructional down to all of the Chromebook responsibilities. Um, and then another piece of advice from my principal um, on how we could improve was that we needed to improve our transparency a lot. At the time, not only did we not have a principal rep who was attending our meetings regularly, but we weren't sharing our minutes from our meetings. And so we created um, a shareable version from then on of our meeting agendas and minutes and they get sent to all of the admin in our district after each of our library council meetings. This not only provided transparency, but it also kind of pushed us to the next level. We wanna make sure, and we should be, and we do already on our own, but everything that we do should be something that speaks for itself. Um, and then 
The next question was really to ask where are people? They may not always be in your library, but how can you show them? They may not even be walking by your front door to see everything. So social media, like Anthony mentioned, is a great way to show, give people a glimpse of what's happening inside your library. Um, I don't necessarily have the hugest number of followers or likes all the time, but I do want people to remember just because people aren't liking your posts doesn't mean they're not lurking. I've had people, students and adults, make comments where it's quite obvious that they have seen my social media even though they've never engaged with it. And even if they are not looking right now, it doesn't mean that later at some point they won't. And I love the fact that if they do come across your profile at some point, they can see the full history of what you've posted because not one single post will tell the whole story of your library. It's really the story that's told over time. And there's a lot of power in the fact that it is time and date stamped. You can't go back and recreate this story about your library. There is authenticity in the fact that it's been recorded over time. And the reason why I do have all the, like Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook is think about where the people are in terms of which platforms they're using. In our district, it's a lot of like district and site administrators who are on Twitter students on Instagram and parents and community members on Facebook, it's extra work maybe to post them across the different platforms, but you reach different segments of the population that way. So another thing that we're really mindful of is how busy principals are. So the three of us all started after our teacher librarian programs writing blogs and having lots of like the library blog that we wanted to share out with everyone. But in all honesty, the, li the, the principal wasn't reading it. I mean, sh my principal doesn't have any time for that sort of thing. She's much bigger fish to fry. So um, what Suzanne realized, though, is that her principal writes a blog each week for the staff. And um, my principal writes one for the staff and for, student, for students and parents to read. Like, they're, they're very similar, actually. Um, and so Suzanne just made the suggestion that she could be a part of that blog and have a little blurb in each one. And so now she's in the principal's blog each week and she's taken her little participant or participatory like blurbs and archived them all together. Um, and those are, are she can you can go to her her website and then see each of the moments where she's participated in that weekly blog. That's a really great way to start advocating very easily, but nobody's gonna ask you to do it. You have to, you have to make the suggestion. And honestly, principals like are all, I think they're trying to fill the space sometimes that they don't always have a lot to share. So they do really appreciate your willingness to help out. Um, and another thing that we did, and I think that this came from Kim, um, so the principal at El Cajon Valley, who's been, like, went from not attending our meetings all that regularly to becoming our greatest champion, um, she suggested that we do, like, just a quick three-question survey of, of the actual principals as well as admin um, in the district. And um, so those questions were, so we put together, these, these two put it together, and the three questions are, were, the first one are three words that you would use to describe the library or the GUHSD library program as a whole. And then the two other questions, the, the second one was based on AASL standards, and then the third one was based on the um, future ready librarians kind of standards. And so what, there was like a secret agenda there is to make sure that we were using the language that we, of those standards that we're held accountable for to see if we're meeting those particular standards, but then to get them familiar with those standards as well, because maybe they haven't looked at them in a while. Um, and the results were really helpful to us. Um, those were the, the word cloud is the three words. I was really, my, I, I, can, I recognize my principal's handwriting and she wrote amazing. And I, it, I'm still on cloud nine from seeing that because it really made me feel amazing. It did make me feel amazing. But also we learned, like, it helped us to formulate the plan for what we're going to do as we move forward because it's not me and my library that needs to move forward. It's the district libraries, all of us together collectively. They suggested that we start working more on community partnerships. That's something where we haven't branched out much. Anthony's done a little bit with the local library because he is an amazing teen librarian who, like, comes in and stuff, which is, I wish, that's amazing. So, but it really helps us in that respect. And then it also kind of takes the heat off. It's not my principal telling me, you should be doing this. But it's 
the whole council talking to all of us about where we want to move forward as a district. Um, other ways that you can get involved is through school marketing. Um, so uh, the picture there is from our school, like in San Diego, choice is a big issue, school choice, um, particularly in our district. So people, parents shop. So we've created events, nighttime events, where parents come in and like preview the school. We'd put, like at Valhalla, it's a, it's a, it was just this week. So like the dance team's out and the band's there and we really try to sell the school because we have competition with charter, good charter schools right next to us. So um, Suzanne noticed that the other departments had flyers as they were distributing them like at their tables talking about their different departments. Nobody asked her to, she just decided, oh, I better get one too. So she made a flyer for the library. And one thing that I've really learned is the library does sell our schools in contrast to San Diego Unified right next door. Um, Anthony manages the school website. Um, so does another librarian in our district, uh, Chan Simone O'Meara. Um, Anthony is the co-writer of the WASC report for his school. I was the WASC coordinator for three cycles. Um, and we're working to try to be a part of the LCAP program. We had, all three of us attended the strategic planning meeting that our district held uh, just last Saturday. Uh, and uh, we, we divided and conquered. We made sure that we were each in a different room so that we could talk about what our concerns were as librarians. And, I'm a, and Anthony and I are both parents. Suzanne will be is a future parent pretty soon. So we were able to do that very easily. Um, so we asked that question, like, where are you missing? What do you need to do to get involved? Um, so. Next question, this is me, yes, me? Okay, so the, another question. How do you show both your value and your needs at the same time? So one thing is Suzanne used to, it, having the library open as long as possible is, has always been everyone's goal in our school district. But for Suzanne, who doesn't have a paraprofessional, it started to become like really logistically difficult because the people who came in in the afternoon to relieve her, it was always a different person. Um, it was like a substitute, uh, like the on-site substitute. It might be uh, like somebody who's just making $15 an hour. It might be uh, one of our campus supervisors. And the coverage wasn't consistent, like meaning that uh, people were scheduled to come, they wouldn't show up. Um, and then the library would randomly be closed. So she moved from a sign that kind of looks like what is on the left, which was on her door, um, to just making a decision that the library should just be closed for those hours because the quality of the service wasn't very good. That's a consequence of some decisions that were made, but she had permission and support from her principal to do so. It's just what they were able to do. And so she set a limit. And you can ask yourself that question, what limits can you set? Also, it's really important to be able to realize that you may need to ask for help um, we asked the school district to fund every single school site with a paraprofessional because less than half of us have one. I have one, Anthony has one, Suzanne does not. And our job satisfaction is vastly different. Like Anthony and I have, we're able to work with our teachers and do the spirit of our job very easily. It's much harder for Suzanne to do those things because she's still managing the library space all the time. I know, amen, right? But asking for help in other ways, we didn't get that help. They said no. So what do we do? So we ask for help in other ways. Uh, one way is one of the librarians who also does not have a paraprofessional, she just met with her principal. She's like, this isn't sustainable. Who, how, who else can we tap into to get some help? And they actually came up with a plan so that she is not managing Chromebooks in the same way that the rest of the schools are because she just doesn't have the time or the resources to do so. And that's working for their school site so far. Um, and for us, I mean, for Suzanne in, in particular, that like the first week of first few weeks of school when we're doing all the Chromebook checkouts, she needs additional help 
to help her get through that. I have, we have two of us and then an admin comes in and helps me at my site, but Suzanne doesn't have that kind of support necessarily. So asking the district and then as well as our site, you know, can we get a substitute to come in and at least help us in this respect? So she, she got help at the beginning of the school year, at the end of the school year. We also asked for extra days in the summer to help us organize the materials. Um, and there's nothing consistent there, but there is precedent now that we have asked for and gotten help. But we try to get really creative so Anthony is going to talk about data. Thank you. All of these, these are great examples. They're wonderful things that you want to be able to share. Um, it's also valuable to have numbers to collect. And I know we have, we can generate numbers like circulation data and all of that. Um, but there, there's probably more that we could be doing around this. I saw, um, well, we can, we can find uh, information to gather, data to gather around patron visits, around the amount of collaboration and co-teaching we do, um, and also we can collect feedback from our patrons. This is a, a tweet by uh, a teacher, Bud Hunt, that I saw on, online, and he makes the case that um, we want to collect data or, or um, use data in order to tell a story um, that, that shows uh, what's valuable about us and what we're doing. So with that in mind, one of the first things that we thought of collecting data on is our patrons. Who, how many people are coming through our doors? I know um, uh, Suzanne, Stephanie, they have door counters. I don't have uh, a door counter, but what I did do is I set up a few old Chromebooks and students as they enter the library, they punch in their ID number and they select a reason for their visit. Just that. Um, from there, that's been like the gift that keeps on giving as far as data collection. I have three years of data now uh, around student check-ins. I know my total visits for the year. I can show that those visits have been growing. I have on display, Williams, right? Isn't that it? No, actually, General Library, Google Sheets. Yeah, they, it's a Google form. It's a Google form that's the, they, they, it's a Google form. They type in their number and they check a box and hit submit, and that's it. Um, and it's. It's just, like I said, it's been the gift that keeps on giving. One of the things they check is like, oh, I'm, I'm here for Chromebook concerns. Something's wrong with my Chromebook. Great. I can see that I've had about um, 2,100 students click that Chromebook box, and we've put in 282 for repair, so I'm able to say, well, we've been troubleshooting about 1,700 Chromebooks then. They're, for whatever reason, we've been able to keep it from being a problem in the district. That's a great number to be able to share. Um, Suzanne started a spreadsheet at her site where she's keeping track of Chromebook problems and how they're getting repaired and when they put, got put in for repair and when they got returned. Really valuable data to have. And now that's a system that's district-wide. Everybody's um, looking at that data now. And, and it also is one more thing that shows our value. Two additional, two additional um, repairmen, uh, not library tech. So, <laughs> yes, and I can show things like if you look at that that data, I am doing about 25% of the intake for repairs on our on our spreadsheet. My tech is doing 75% of that work. It's a wonderful thing to be able to share with people who make decisions about staffing. And like I said, it's the gift that keeps on giving. Once you have a spreadsheet with a student's ID number, you can cross-reference that with, um, with schedules, with GPAs, with names. So they're not, telling, they're not typing in a name. That takes too much time. But I do have a display on my, at the circulation desk, and I can say, hey, um, Saul, thanks for visiting the library. Good to see you. I've also been able to compare frequency of visits to average student GPA. And I know um, correlation doesn't necessarily mean causation and all of that stuff, but it is, uh, I think, a positive thing to share about the library that, wouldn't you know it, the more frequently students visit the library, the higher on average their GPA is. It's just a, a fun number to be able to share with, with stakeholders. And that's kept true uh, over the years. If your district is like mine, when students sign in with their ID number, their ID number is also their email address. You just have to add in the domain name at the end. So I can target um, marketing or feedback requests from students and say, hey, Laurel, you visited the library 151 times this year. Can you help me out and fill out this survey? I want to know if we're, we're meeting your needs and what suggestions you might have. And the first year I did this, I just messaged the whole school with a general message. I had 30 responses. This year when I did it, I had 115 responses of the 500 students that I messaged. I messaged the top 500. Uh, visitors, and they just gave me very valuable information for how the library is being used, on, as well as uh, some suggestions that I was thinking of implementing in the library. That way I can get more stakeholder feedback before just deciding unilaterally to do these things. And so generally what I'm doing is, is a Google Forms sign-in sheet, 
It's um, an add-on called Form Mule to send those emails. They're all linked right here if you want to check that out sometime. The other thing I'm sure to do is every single time I collaborate or co-teach with uh, a staff member, um, basically any time where I'm able to do something because I have a tech at the circulation desk, I make sure to document that on my Google Calendar. And I go back and I count those individually because a lot, some of the stuff on the calendar is like, check out the textbooks to this group of visiting the library. I'm not counting that. I'm counting going to this teacher's classroom to talk about digital portfolios or helping this student with their community engagement project. Those are the things that I want to be able to share, um, kind of almost as protection of look at all the things I'm able to do because I have a tech. Um, and if that ever changes, my tech is going to retire someday, I'll be able to share, like, I, I want to still be able to do this. I want to serve our school this way. This is why we need to, to make sure we hire this per, uh, another person to take this person's place after they retire. Okay, this section really talks about the, com the collaboration that we have both in our library council, but also across libraries. Um, people that we connect with in our digital PLNs, for instance. Um, how can we collaborate versus compete? Um, there was not always such a cohesive body of librarians in our library council when we first started off in our careers. Um, and so we've built a lot of camaraderie and I, we've come to a place where everybody is really um, supporting each other. So this leads to how can we support and celebrate one another and steal like an artist, which I stole from Austin Cleon, if you don't know his work. Um, in terms of support, this just came out in the February School Library Journal, an article called Stress Tested. It talks about compassion fatigue, and it has quotes and a photo of Anthony with his library tech and how that has enabled him to have a lot of job satisfaction. There's another librarian who is quoted and featured in the article who does not have a paraprofessional and how that has made her job much more unsustainable. Um, and so I feel very supportive that even though Anthony has somebody, he's really also trying to support the rest of us getting them as well. Um, in terms of celebrating one another, I just want to give a shout out to Stephanie. She was selected as staff member of the month at her school <laughs> recently. Just so you know, Anthony's won teacher of the year and Suzanne was a golden apple winner as well. So, I mean, <laughs> they won bigger awards. But whether it's um, <laughs> whatever it is, uh, sometimes it's hard to brag about yourself. So brag on your, on your colleagues and really celebrate them. And it may be celebrating other librarians who are doing work, even if they are not in your school or in your district. Um, and then this is also something that Stephanie posted recently. She did an activity. A lot of people have done blind date with a book. She did it just this past week where she had passages um, from the books, like really good passages from the books and had students read them without seeing the actual book and select their titles that way. You can see a comment from one of our other colleagues um, who wrote, I love it, I might steal this idea. And we say in all cases, yes, please steal it. If you access our slide deck, almost everything is hyperlinked. So if you're on a slide, try clicking around because we have links to all our work because our goal is not just for us to be um, having successes. We want all school libraries to have successes so that our students can. Um, and then again, this is how can we work collectively to benefit students. We did, not only do we have maybe our own annual reports, this last year we did a district-wide um, reflection on three successes from last year as a library program, district-wide lab library program, and three goals for the next year. This picture is from Yale West. It's another teacher librarian who contributes in different ways, like tap into the strengths of different team members. She organizes a field trip and she actually was able to get the funding for a bus for us to go to Yale West. We were able to attend because of her graciousness to include us in that. And so it's really a collection, we can't all, we can't do it all. It's way too stressful. And so the more that you can team with other people, how can we collectively benefit students? Um, this is another new endeavor that we started. One of our goals, the three goals from, um, that we had was to share information more district-wide, including our alternative ed schools who maybe don't have teacher librarians, but still benefit from the same district subscriptions that we have. 
And so we have implemented a really bite-sized resource snack time that comes out every week. And rather than branding it just for any one particular school site, it's branded for the district so that anybody can copy the information to share with their staff. And so rather than just recreating the wheel each time, what can you do to serve the collective good? And so this is an example of some of the topics. It's all archived. Um, we not only have the topic that's covered, but at the bottom of each of them, it's also a uh, marketing push. We have, again, you'll see the open doors for students, a reminder to collaborate with teacher librarians. Um, that's coming out every week now. Um, and then I'll just share an example. Again, it's not just necessarily advocating um, two people in your own district. My niece follows my social media because she's a school teacher in a different district. Um, she doesn't have a very active librarian at her site, but she saw this and she shared it with her principal and said, hey, did you know that there's this thing, News Literacy Week, and that there are these resources available? Maybe we could work with our librarian at our school and do something with this next year. And so the, when you do share things out socially, you may never know the benefits that are possibly um, out there, elsewhere, um, with libraries in general. Um, and then the last question, again, returns to Stephanie's, um, what she was pointing out at the beginning. Rather than saying like, oh, poor us with the dog at the beginning, um, really taking the focus off yourself. We're doing self-reflection, but how can we make our work always focused on everybody, on the students, on them, on our stakeholders? And so um, the question I ask is, we talk a lot about making our collections inclusive, and I am definitely behind that. We want to have books that serve as mirrors and windows. Um, but we also think about it more globally with our libraries. Can people see themselves in your library in general, not just in the materials? Um, and so these are just some different examples. You can see Stephanie. Um, she had art students who created ceiling tiles with book covers. I, have an, I also do collaboration with our art teachers a lot. So our entire library is basically decorated with student artwork. If you've heard of the GLAM movement of galleries, libraries, archives, and museums, um, anything that you can do to bring the work of the students in, they may not come in to check out a book, but they may be excited to see their work on display in your library. Also, I had won a grant um, to get a big screen TV and my um, idea was that it was going to be digital signage and I would promote all the services that the library have available. Nobody really cared about it at all. And so I've made a, a collaborative slide deck. I tried one month where it was submit a picture of your dog and you can have it because we're a wolf pack. So it was like we did a dog theme. Um, it was so popular that that's all I've been doing now for the last year. And now it's any pet that you have. Students can submit, we have teachers who submit. It's a running slideshow of people's pets. It has absolutely nothing to do with books. <laughs> but students look at it constantly and it's really a matter of community building and people connecting. Um, and then another super popular thing, I have a height chart. <laughs> students can add their stickers to it and they are stopping every single day. Students, even if they don't want to add their name sticker, they're measuring themselves. And it's something that they can feel like they belong in your library. Um, and then the last example I have, um, I started because the student here, I got like a, f I saw somebody share a free library, like thankfulness, a thankfulness calendar and something to be grateful for every month. So I was like, oh, let me share it. I put it up on display. Um, and the next month he said, well, where's the next calendar? So I started creating, okay, well, I'll create a calendar, so now every month I create a calendar that goes out to um, not only the school, like I post it up in the library, but we send it out to parents and the principal's blog, different things, and there's a theme every month. But instead, like sometimes I'll have like, today this will focus on different digital resources that are available for you. But sometimes I'll use it, this was a lot of work, but it was also a lot of fun. I created a Google survey for staff and it was all of these questions related to things happening in November, like different month celebrations, to get to know them. And then every day I would have some kind of reveal, like either a video or um, a picture, and it would have the, the teacher's responses. So that was a fun way. If you want to see yourself highlighted, you can log into our social media and see yourself. Um, and so <coughs> that is uh, the last slide in our slide deck. We have four minutes if you have questions. 
Yeah. It, yes, in our presentation, we actually have a few minutes if anybody has any questions. That was kind of a lot. Yeah. And you should definitely check out, Anthony is also very sharing. He has all of the, uh, if you don't have the links there too, yeah, yeah he but has. Um, on, on the slide deck, uh, those things that uh, link to the, hi the how-to guide, it's, a, it's a, a web page that shows step-by-step -step even what formulas to use to get started with, like the spreadsheet formulas. You're gonna get to know them better as you, as you play with that. But yeah, all that's copyable. Our, my email is on there, my social media is on there. I've had, um, after we talk about things, sometimes teachers will message and say, the spreadsheet doesn't work the way you said, how do you fix it? And I, I help with that. It's, it's, I try to make it so that it's um, uh, just usable by anybody, but once in a while there, there are still questions. But yeah. When I have classes visit, uh, when we have AVID programs or counseling programs where 100 kids are coming in at a time or more, yes, I have them sign in. Um, it's been very useful. Even when I have like counselors, they want to check. Yeah. Yes. It just says submit another response. Yep, and they submit. And there are, we've only, we haven't had more than 120 or 150 days. There's a kid on there with 250 sign-ins. He's there every morning, every break, every lunch. The sign-in doesn't work as well at my site because of where my library tech sits, um, and I'm so busy moving around that I can't monitor it as well. So a lot of it has to do with the, you know, the basically the layout of your library and whether or not you can have a space. But I will say something about Anthony's library tech. She is so regimented. She's like, sign in, <laughs> sign in. And she, so they're all very well trained to do it. Um, where at my school site, it's like they're trying to get away with it. So we work more with the door counter at my school site. And that's not always super accurate, but it is, does tell you how many kids walk in and out every day. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so um, we have uh, gates um, that are made by 3M, I think, uh, that are the security gates and inside that is there's a little door counter that counts every time somebody walks by in in and then it goes again when they walk out so any pass through yeah but um suzanne does not have that in her library oh, oh you know you have it you do have a door counter oh, i'm sorry anthony doesn't have a door counter Well, um, I think it's because uh, with local controlled funding, um, what happened is that when our site, te when our library techs retired, our the principal at the site had to make decisions about what jobs to fund, and so some schools have a counseling secretary, some schools have a book clerk, some schools have a library tech. Mine does. Um, and it's mostly, my library will see, I can easily have 1,700 visits in a day because I have a big space. Um, so uh, they make those decisions on a site level. So that's, I guess that's like maybe one of the negatives of the local control funding. That's ha that, that if and those, those decisions might have gotten made nine years ago by a, by a previous principal and it kind of le gets legacied in and, and it's, so the ask, when we went to talk to a principal's council about this, our, our ask is we recognize this is a district cost and it's a very, it's a big district cost. And the places like mine, my school site, they might say, well, you're giving extra funding so that she can have a, a tech. I'm using my site funds to cover our tech. So we want that money too. So it makes it a significant expense for the district. And we get that to be fair. That is a significant expense. We still want it. So our district is like the United States of Grossmont. So each school is a very different entity. Um, and they pride themselves on the uniqueness of each school and how they're run. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. High School District. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you.